It took supernatural intervention to change the Jewish culture of Christianity to a paganized Greek culture on this edition of It's Supernatural. Centuries have come and gone, offering wisdom and understanding throughout the ages. Today, there should be nothing beyond one's power to discover. And yet, the strange, unusual, and mysterious world of the supernatural defies understanding. Stay tuned for a unique and powerful investigation into a curious, undiscovered universe only on It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. I'm here with Dr. Howard Morgan. Another Jewish man that says, <laughs> coming from an orthodox, traditional type of Jewish background, that boldly says that Jesus is his Messiah. How come, Howard? When I was a college student, I was 21 years old, I was uh, asked a question, and the question uh, had to do with who is Jesus. And so two uh, students were, and I were talking about this. And as we began to talk about this, some supernatural things began to happen to me. It was in a crowded cafeteria in Hunter College. They approached me and said, we'd like to talk to you. And they said, what do you want to talk about? They said, we'd like to talk about Jesus. I said, go ahead. Um, you know, being an intellectual in those days, college students, you know, open to everything. But I was not prepared for what kind of supernatural things would begin to unfold in this ca crowded cafeteria. As they began to discuss this with me, I felt what I, uh, what I could only describe as a presence kind of come around us. So how do you know this wasn't drugs? Well, because when you are involved with drugs, things tend to fall apart inwardly. Things are not knit together. And as they were speaking to me, I could feel like a wholeness come inside of me, a peace, like this is right, Had follow this. Had you ever this. felt this before? Not really. I knew that God existed, but I felt like I was being personally encountered. And then the next thing that happened is that a vision opened up inside of me. I saw myself sit as a man drowning in a sea, and a huge ocean liner was coming by, and I saw the captain of the boat standing as the ocean liner was passing by, and I heard the voice of God, and I knew it was God. It was so clear and powerful into my spirit and I heard these words, Howie, I will throw you a life preserver and save you, but if you don't take it, I won't take responsibility for what will happen to you next. At that instant, there flashed in my mind incidents in car accidents, three distinct car accidents where my life was spared and also where I was ready to be arrested for possession of, of narcotics, but the police officer's hand was stopped like one inch away from finding the contraband and the Holy Spirit was clearly showing me I was taking responsibility. That's why you didn't get arrested and you didn't die in those car accidents, but now you're like a man drowning in the sea and I won't take responsibility for what will happen happen to you next. I knew he had been watching over my life, but that was about to change. Well, what happened next? Well, um, these college students and I, we were, we were discussing what it means to really be a believer. And they asked me if I wanted to pray and ask Jesus into my life. But I really, at that particular moment, wasn't really ready to do that. So I got on the subway to go home. It was in Manhattan. I was living in Brooklyn at the time. And I'm sitting on a crowded subway train, December of 1971, sitting there, you know, minding my own business. And Sid, I heard in my right ear a clear voice begin to speak to me and say these words, Howie, read the prayer. Read the prayer now. What prayer? Uh, they had given me a little booklet that had mm -hmm. explained the gospel and was a little prayer in it. And the voice was very insistent and very persistent. Howie, read the prayer. Read the prayer now. Howie, read the prayer. Read the prayer now. So I said under my breath, all right already, I'll read the prayer. So I went to my back pocket. Literally, this is exactly what happened. I got the little booklet out of my back pocket, and there was a little prayer asking Jesus to come into my life. I read the prayer. The instant I finished reading the prayer, a bright, bold light literally exploded inside of me. I felt and saw dark forces leave my body. I stood up because this power had just got turned on inside of me. What, what, what kind of dark forces I can't, left I don't, I, I, in those How days, did you I know it was a dark force? I saw it. It was black. It left me. Black shadows left my body when this light exploded inside of me. At that moment, I knew 
that God was real, that Jesus was alive, my whole life in that second turned around. I went home, I was dating a, a, a Jewish girl at the time, Terrell told her everything that happened. She looked at me and said, you sound different and you have a funny look in your eye. I went outside wait, on wait her a second. Porch. What sure. was going on inside of you? Oh, a tremendous sense of peace and joy and well-being. And uh, uh, this inc it really was an incredible sense of joy and peace. I mean, those words sometimes don't carry the But you're meaning. Jewish. That's right. You're Jewish. Didn't yeah. it bother you? I mean, you raised in a traditional family, no, Brooklyn? No, because you know what this was all about? It was oh. about meeting God, which is what I learned in the synagogue and what I learned in Hebrew school and putting on to fill in, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these people all had an encounter with God. This wasn't about religion. This was about a personal encounter with the living God. And I just had one. And I went outside and I looked up in the sky and I saw three angels dancing with tambourines. And my thought was, wow, there's a party going on up there. Why were they having a party? Because the Bible says, when a sinner repents, the angels in heaven rejoice. And I had repented, went home, threw away all my drug paraphernalia, started to read the Bible, had this desire to pray and just talk about Jesus to everybody that I met. They, of course, went crazy, but... Um, God started doing wonderful things. And the most amazing thing to me was this overwhelming sense of peace and joy and well-being. Well, 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 well. I've never taken drugs, but I'm told you have a peace and uh, euphoric type feeling when you take drugs. Yes, but difference? it always is short-lived and when it's over you're feeling terribly depressed and you need to go back for more drugs or stronger drugs because the previous didn't work. But this was nothing to do with that. I threw all my drugs away and there was a spiritual sense rising from deep within me. This. Uh, presence, if you will, of power, of empowerment, of joy, and of peace. It was all day long. I mean, I, I walked around. I went back to school after the vacation. How many years ago? Uh, this was 1971. So today, this is 28. Today, today, yes. time's going by. Right. What's going on inside Same you? peace and joy. This is the remarkable testimony that all through the difficulties, battles of life that everybody has, ups and downs and whatever, there was this rock bottom peace that I have had in my life, this joy that is a buoyancy. It is How Howard became a PhD and he has studied something that is so amazing. It's literally supernatural of how something that started, you had to be Jewish to believe in Jesus 2,000 years ago. Everything was Jewish. The authors of the, uh, of the New Covenant outside of Dr. Luke, and of course, how many non-Jewish doctors do you know? Just kidding. When we come back, we're gonna find out how something so Jewish got to be thought of as the opposite of Judaism. Don't go away. It's Supernatural will return right after this. Hello, it's Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. I'm here with Dr. Howard Morgan. So how did Christianity, which started so Jewish become today the opposite of Judaism to most Jewish people? Dr. Howard Morgan. That's a really important and fascinating question because you see this, you see the history of man kind of wrapped up in this, 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 this dynamic of what happened. We see the Jewish people rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. We see the Gentile church reject her Jewish connection to the Jewish people. The Apostle Paul told So you can the church, say we humans are just plain rejected people. Yeah, we are. <laughs> and we operate, this is an important point, Sid, we operate out of that rejection because we're always trying to get somebody either to love us, we're trying to get them to approve us, or we're trying to get them to try to control them so that we can be uh, in a position of control and getting that love. And that's a fascinating insight because you can, we're, you look we're, at this. We're operating out of hurt. Absolutely. Hurt. We're 
we're, we're reacting to our situations mm -hmm. rather than responding to God. And you see that in the early church fathers, rather than being um, embracing their own spiritual culture, the Jewish people, they got afraid that the Jewish people, because they rejected Jesus, were going to take their quote unquote converts away from them. And because they rejected the Bible and the Apostle Paul's admonition, don't be arrogant against the branches, the roots support you. You're saying the, the, the Gentile church rejected the, the Bible? Absolutely. They rejected the authority of the scriptures because if they had obeyed the scriptures, we'd have a very different world today. So what they did was begin to pick and choose what they wanted. And the reason they did that is because they went into a non-Jewish culture. By rejecting their Jewish roots, they went into this pagan uh, Greco-Roman worldview that was very different than the Jewish view of the world. But it, what's the difference? Well, I'm going to explain that. The, the, the Romans had what, uh, the Greeks had what we call a dualistic view. That is, they separated the material and the spiritual. The Hebrew culture that produced the Bible had no such separation. Everything was spiritual. That's why now in modern day Christianity, people can go to church and think, oh, my spiritual life is done, and they go and do whatever they want. Uh, in effect, we can segment things. Exactly. That's uh, Sunday or Saturday, I right. do my thing with God. The rest of the week, I do my right. thing for me. That's exactly right. And that all came out of the Greco-Roman hmm. culture, the world view that they had that allowed them, see, because their view of God is, oh, you throw a little incense on a burner, you know, you did your thing with God, that God wasn't really interested in your morality or your character, and you did whatever you wanted because you did your religious thing. But the Hebrew scriptures and the revelation of the God of Israel in the scriptures was saying, no, God is concerned with our morality. He's concerned with our lifestyle. He's concerned with our character, and he has given us instruction, commandments on how to live. When the church rejected her Jewish roots, that, became put as that was put aside, and what began to develop slowly over the first few centuries of the Christian era, and what happen is we see a non-Jewish faith emerge. But why did we reject it? Well, we rejected it, I think, for a number of reasons. And I, when I say we, I don't mean we, I said they did. One is they were afraid that they were going to lose converts. Two is they wanted to make this religion palatable to the intellectuals of the Western world that they were trying to bring the gospel to. Are you to. telling me they had what we call today a seeker-friendly church well, so it would <laughs> blend in. <laughs> well, in, in. In some ways they, they were, but they, what they, they made the mistake of being, here's a fancy word, they made a mistake of being synchristic. That okay. is they tried to bring everything together to please everybody rather than preaching the gospel that brought the faith to the Roman Empire in the first place. Because when the original apostles, the Jewish apostles and prophets went preaching, there was power and signs and wonders and miracles because people then, like are today and our viewers, are hungry for reality. And and they were coming into reality. Lives were being changed. People were being healed. People were being set free from their insecurities, from their fears. Marriages and families were being put together because the power of God was being made available to them. Are you telling me there is a connection between the loss of the power of God yes, exactly. and the rejection of our biblical Jewish heritage? Right, absolutely. And we can follow that parallel right through history. As the church rejected, the Bible calls them anointed roots. That is they had the power of God flow, the reality of God flowing, and the message of the kingdom of God, the reality of God in somebody's life was being proclaimed. When the church turned away from that, things started happening. The church became political. It became mili military. Instead of people wanting to see others raised up as disciples, they wanted to manipulate and control them because an organization developed that had to now protect itself. In order to protect itself, it had to cut out anything that would threaten it. Jewish believers threatened it because Jewish believers in the church came and said, no, that's not the way this is supposed to be done. We're not supposed to have this kind of a hierarchical system in which clergy uh, manipulates and controls laity. This is a relational thing that we all have with God, uh, or that we, we all have with each other because we're supposed to grow and nourish each other in the faith. That was lost, but God is restoring it in many congregations today. We're seeing a renewal of this Jewish roots interest in churches. All right, give, give me some specifics. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
the biblical festivals, Passover, exactly. Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, all of Shavuot. That. Uh, uh, why is the church not following these biblical well, directives? Well, ba basically, in the, in the third century, Constantine, quote unquote, had a conversion, and he began to make laws. He called all the bishops to him. You know, the emperor said, come, because these were people who were persecuted by the Roman emperors. Now, all of a sudden, the emperor's saying, hey, guys, I'm on your side. I want to establish you as the religion of the state. So but, what looks for good was actually used for bad. Uh, the, uh, sure, because he wanted to be able to control the empire, and he, he wanted to control the military and religiously. So he set up a religion, but he had deep roots of anti-Semitism, and the church had already been infected by that because she had rejected what Paul said, don't be arrogant. You know, they, they, they turned their back on the Jewish people. The spiritual forces that began to come into play said to the, the church, listen, the Jews have rejected Jesus, the Messiah, their own Messiah. Therefore, God has rejected them. They're nothing anymore. Now the Gentiles, the church, is the new Israel. God's done with the Jews, we've replaced the Jews, and we are the new Israel. With that one lie, a whole world of, of negative influences were brought into the church because now there was no connection to the Jewish people, and now they were open to any influence that would come from this the pagan world that was around All them. All that thought and the influences came, as you're aware of. We'll be right back after this. You think you have a problem? You should see two Messianic Jews by the name of Paul and Silas. They could not keep quiet of the fact that Yeshua, that's Hebrew for Jesus, is the Jewish Messiah. So they were put in prison. And there was such a warning given, they were put into the depth of the prison. There was no heat or air conditioning. Uh, it was rat infested. They were put in stocks. They couldn't even move. They were beaten. They were bloody. It was, there was no electricity. There was no light. It was midnight. And you know what they did? The last thing most people would do in those kind of circumstances, they began worshiping and praising God for all they were worth. They began singing songs to God, and suddenly God came on the scene. He showed up, and it says there was like an earthquake, and the prison doors opened up. You should try singing and praising God when things are tough because you're about ready to have your earthquake. Hello, Sid Roth, your investigative reporter here with Dr. Howard Morgan. And the question that I have for Dr. Morgan, and I believe you have it too, is how does what is known as the church today differ from the very first followers of Jesus who were all Jewish what, and had the power. They had, as the commercial said, they had the beef. Right. How, how, how did it differ? What were they doing that we're not doing today? Well, they understood the nature of revelation and the nature of spiritual reality. And they were seeking God for revelation rather than a rationalistic understanding. They understood that God was inviting them into a relationship with himself and a relationship in each other that had a purpose. The relationship with God was to change us, and then our relationship with each other was to help each other grow in this relationship with God. Now, today, we have people going to a building to observe a ritual that doesn't change them because they're disengaged from it in terms of revelation. They just kind of go through the rituals and all the churches are doing that. So we basically have a theater that goes on. People go to a building to observe the show and then they leave left to their own devices because the power isn't being exchanged. And that really, Sid, is the heart of the difference, the power of God now not being manifest in the ministry. You go to churches and people preach. You know, there's the preacher and people hear something. But because they're, they're not engaged with God personally, they're not able to receive the anointing, the power of God operating in their life. And then the people, the community. See, if we say church to most people, they think a building you go to right. to observe a religious ritual. But the kihila in Hebrew, what Jesus said, the congregation was a relational thing. It's everybody helping each other, supporting each other, looking after each other, studying the scriptures together, now, how a flow the, of how life. How different was the culture? between the first Jewish believers in the Messiah and what we have today. 
Well, um, the culture was, again, it was this dynamic of, of, of understanding that we were a tribe together, that we were a family together. Most people who go to church today don't even talk to one another. You no, know, what I meant was things like, did they observe Passover? Oh, yes, they observed, they observed all the feasts of the Lord because they understood that those feasts were times of meeting with God for specific purposes, a time to remember what God had promised and, very importantly, to call to mind what God uh, is going to do. This is what makes the Jewish religion and the Jewish people so distinctive because they are a prophetic people that God called this nation for a prophetic purpose to bring to pass his redemptive purposes in the world. That's why the Jewish people are different than the, the French people or the Asian people. God loves everybody but he has put a prophetic call upon them. This is another reason what why... What is the prophetic call? The on prophetic the call is to be a light to the nation and to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. That the Jewish people giving birth to the Jewish Messiah, taking this gospel, this good news to all the world, that the... That the Wait a second. The rabbis say we Jews don't proselytize. Well, they're wrong, and we were Why? supposed to, because we were called to be a light to the world. Interestingly, Rashi, one of the great Jewish commentators about the life of Abraham, he said that Rashi was the first mission... Uh, that Abraham was the first missionary that he went to bring the knowledge of God to the nations of the world and all through the scriptures where God is speaking about how he wants to bring all the nations to the knowledge of himself. What is going to happen when the Gentile church embraces the Jewish people and we become one we're new gonna, creation. We're What's going, going to we're happen? We're going to fulfill what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 11 in the Bible, that the church is going to be able then to provoke Israel to jealousy. The church is going to be able to have such a life-giving testimony to the Jewish people that says, your Messiah changed our lives in these profound ways. It's your Messiah. It's not our Messiah. The Gentile nations had no such promise of a Messiah coming to them. Or the Messiah was only promised to the Jewish people. And that Messiah changing the lives of the church being and the church being reconciled to her Jewish roots and reconciled to the Jewish people so that a life-giving testimony can go forth. Then the, the end of the age is going to happen. The Jewish people are going to recognize that Jesus really is the Messiah and call him back from heaven. I think this will happen when there's a time of great crisis upon the Jewish people, when their destruction looks eminent, then they will call upon Jesus. They'll say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and Jesus will come. I believe he is waiting to hear this divine invitation, come back, Mashiach, come back, Messiah. What kind of power can we expect when the church embraces the Jewish people. I think we're going to begin to see the church coming into unity. Pastors no longer at odds with one another over petty artificial theological arguments, but really embracing one another, loving one another. Then churches coming together uh, uh, to, to um, fulfill the call of God that's on their life, life flowing back and forth, so that we're going to see real, authentic signs and wonders and miracles happening on a common level in people's homes, in hospitals, everywhere, because we're really getting connected well, back to the the power of God. What do, you, what do you anticipate seeing in hospitals? I, I think we're going to see all kinds of signs and wonders. We'll see dead people being raised, cancers being healed, power of God, because the church finally is being connected to that authentic source and the authentic purposes of God. Because God isn't giving miracles just to entertain us. It's a sign in Hebrew. It points away. It's a, it's a message to us to repent. It's a message to us to get our life right. It's a message to us to begin to go back to the Bible and study the Bible for ourselves. I want our viewers to think for themselves. Get a Bible for yourself. Ask God, is this really the truth? And let the Holy Spirit, the reality of God, begin to be manifested in their lives. Otherwise, our discussion today is a nice, uh, you know, theological or intellectual discussion about history. And our viewers will miss the point that God has an invitation for them and He wants them to read His Word for themselves and study for themselves. See, this is one of the things that the church lost. It lost this very Jewish thing about studying. So you watch the church, and the church forbade people from reading the Bible. It was a capital there, crime. There seems to be a trend in many churches throughout the world 
to go back to the biblical festivals and to love the Jewish people. Yes, this Why is, is this happening This is a now? move of the Holy Spirit because it's God's time to favor Zion. Israel is being regathered. Jew, uh, Jerusalem is under the hands, control of the Jewish people. Jesus said this would be a major sign of, the, of His coming that Jerusalem would be trodden down under the feet of the Gentiles until a powerful word in the Bible, until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled, 1967, the Six-Day War, that Jerusalem is back under Jewish authority and control and we're watching since that time to this, there have been more Jewish people that have come to faith in Jesus. Now there are messianic congregations all over the world and indigenous Hebrew-speaking messianic congregations in Israel. Sid, this hasn't been true in 1800 years of history, but it's true today because we're approaching the time. God is bringing, stirring people's hearts, all uh, uh, members of the church, believers, real Christians, stirring their heart to saying, something's wrong in the church, what is it? And they're coming to the conclusion, you know what, we're not practicing a Jewish faith anymore. We've been so influenced by a Greco-Roman worldview that we have to go back to the festivals and learn from them. We have to go back to God's calendar and study because these festivals, the Bible says, were all rehearsals of an ultimate spiritual reality that's going to take place. And God is causing the church to rehearse again the coming of the Lord and is the that, purposes is of Is that God. why God says to observe these festivals forever? Yes. Because there are, you use the word rehearsal? Right, that's exactly. Rehearsal of what? Of, of the, what the, each of these festivals has a lesson for us. And the Hebrew word for convocation, these holy convocations, mm -hmm. literally means a holy rehearsal. We're rehearsing history before it happens. We're proclaiming to God and to everybody else that these things are going to happen. And as we study the festivals, we'll see that they all lead to the personal return of the Messiah to rule as king in Hebrew, Melech Mashiach. The personal return of the Messiah. Is He coming for you personally? He is coming. But is He coming for you personally? Someone has just been healed that has a pain in their neck and someone has a pain in their head. God's giving you a supernatural sign right now. You are healed in Yeshua, that's Hebrew for Jesus, in Yeshua's name. And someone's back is being healed right now and someone's hip. But in the head, it's very strong. People are being healed right now. Recognize that's God giving you a sign because He loves you. And some of you are not getting this sign, but recognize by His Spirit, He loves you. You see, if you believe without seeing, more blessed are you. You're just plain blessed. God really does have a destiny for you. There is a purpose for your life.